As the producer of this evening's broadcast, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. These episodes are brought to you as a labor of love. My goal is to continue reaching out to more people in our younger generation with these truths, first-hand accounts of what happened to men and women who have served our country faithfully. There's a link in the video description to make a donation, and I would ask you to do so to help me continue these episodes. Thank you for watching, and God bless you. Good evening. Welcome to this episode of Lest They Be Forgotten. I'm your host, Larry Capetto. In early 1971, under the command of Lieutenant General James Sutherland and the 101st Airborne Division, the United States provided air support for the South Vietnamese offensive into Laos. The operation was called Lam Son 719. The objective of the South Vietnamese Army was to disrupt the North Vietnamese Army's supply and infiltration networks in Laos. On February 8, 1971, Operation Lam Son 719 commenced. Airborne units from the 101st Aviation Group took to the sky. One of the young aviators in the initial air assault was 22-year-old Warrant Officer Thomas Patrick Duty from Grand Junction, Colorado. Warrant Officer Duty had only been in country five months and had already flown over 200 missions. On today's program, Thomas Duty's brother, founder of the Western Colorado Vietnam War Memorial Park's Field of Dreams, Jim Duty, talks about his brother's service during Vietnam. Please join with me in thanking and welcoming home all of our Vietnam veterans. We are truly grateful for your service, sacrifice, dedication, and commitment to preserving our freedoms that we all hold so dear, lest they be forgotten. I turned 18 in 72. I was still in high school. I didn't graduate till 73. My number, I, <clears throat> I believe my number was uh, 11. Uh, but Tom had already been killed in Vietnam. Jerry, my oldest brother, he had already served 61 through 65 in the United States Navy. And Michael, the fourth bro brother, he was in Germany at the time. So <clears throat> when I went down and signed up for the draft, they were like, you don't need to be doing this. We'll, we'll just say you're a sole surviving son. Had, <clears throat> looking back, I wish I wouldn't have done that and then just just went, but it's, it's just the way it was. You know, my mom was pretty broken up with uh, Tom being killed, and our family served. My, my dad was on the second day of Normandy Beach, and he was drafted when he was like 34. So, uh, I mean, our family contributed. My uncle, my great uncle, was mustard gassed in uh, World War One, so we've given a little bit. And he got over there in August of '70, and uh, he ended up flying over 225 missions, which is pretty unheard of. In in uh, from August to uh, early, I think it was late August to uh, February 8th. 1971. Oh, he was he was ready to go. He wanted to go. Um, like I said, he <clears throat> he volunteered, and uh, 
I remember Jerry, Mike, and Rainey, my other siblings, they were all up at uh, CSU at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I drove over to Fort Carson with Tom. He picked up some uh, trinkets for everybody at the PX, and then we drove up to uh, Fort Collins to see them. And then as a group, we went down to Stapleton Airport and we saw him off there. We knew it was dangerous. We knew it was a war. We'd seen it on TV every night. We saw all the protesters in the streets and at the airports and all the other things. So we wasn't real popular, but we were, uh, um, you know, proud of uh, our, our, our service to the country. And, uh, but I remember seeing it well, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, I remember those days. And uh, yeah, what was pretty, pretty amazing was when they launched that invasion. Tom goes in once and then comes back out and then goes back in again and that's when he gets hit. Um, and then we, did, we don't find out, you know, for several days that he's MIA. And then we don't find out for, oh, it's probably 30 days at least that he's MIA. Could the helicopter uh, get hit in the tail boom? They tried to fly it back and uh, <clears throat> the tail boom separated and it went inverted and it went in at about 100 knots, exploded. There was only three bodies recovered, American, and uh, there was one missing. And of course, we all hoped it would be my, <clears throat> our brother. We didn't know how, what had happened. But uh, you know, you've got that hope there in your mom. And, and he had called my mom a couple days before the, and, and told her he was going on this mission and that uh, he was nervous about it. He told her he might not return. My mom worked swing shift. She was a, a nurse. And uh, my little sister Nancy and I were at home. And it was early evening. Knock came on the door and he asked, and the officer asked for my mom. And immediately I knew, immediately. And I told him she wasn't there, where she worked. And then, uh, so he left. I called her, said, somebody's coming to talk to you. So, and then I remember going in and uh, saying a rosary. It was, it was just, we just knew. Yeah. So, it's about a month later before we get the final. I remember uh, I was about, I was over to a friend's house a couple miles away. We were out throwing a football, and my little sister came up on her bicycle. She said, You got to come home. So we jumped on our bikes and went home, and it was terrible. I still, still break up. Uh, but my mom, man, seven kids, raised us alone, and uh, she, uh, she was strong. I mean, jeez, unbelievable. It was pretty harrowing. I mean, when you think about how long it is. And you're sitting there waiting, and I, I believe to the day my mom died, she thought Tom might have got out and was living in the jungle all that time. And so she dies like 13 years later, um, but I think she always had that hope that he had gotten out. But it was actually BNR, body not recovered, that is Paul Stewart. It's his body that wasn't recovered, but nobody got out. I went to the VHPA, Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, in 1999 just to try and find some answers and let them know that I'm going to build this thing. And it was held in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, 4th of July. 
So I meet with them all and they're talking and you know everybody has their own memories and, and whatnot. And, and I told them my mom's story and whatnot and they said, you gotta go up and meet somebody. And the, the gentleman, I can't remember his first name, but it's Klein and he is a very well-known uh, artist. He does a lot of uh, helicopter scenes and, and things like that. But anyways, he was a door gunner and he was flying up above my brother when they were turned around and trying to come. And he saw the whole thing, he saw the tail boom and, and they went inverted and he, he said, nobody got out of that. So, you know, that was a big relief for me. Um, you know, but my mom never got to know that. And that was heartbreaking for sure. My mom said, this was, this was kind of interesting. My mom said to him, I want Marshall Davis to escort Tom mm -hmm. home. And he said, well, we can't do that. He is in a war zone and clear over and, you know, Tom's in Japan and he's in Vietnam. And my mom said, I'm gonna call my senator. He goes, state or U.S.? She said, U.S. He said, well, well, can you hold on for a minute? And so Marshall gets notified. He doesn't even know. So he's shocked. He flies up to Japan, escorts Tom home. I always felt bad for Marshall because he got to come home. And I remember them at Walker Field the coffin coming down, flag draped. My mom, Irish Catholic, did a three-day wake. I never left the, the mortuary once, just stayed there the three days. And then, and it's, you know, it's, it's so surreal where you're doing this funeral and uh, You got a lot of people that come, and people are bringing you food, and it's just a real Western t tradition. And and uh, but it's it's uh, it's so moving. But as soon as the funeral is over, boom, it's done. The government is completely gone. You're just you're just left there. He died on February 8th, 71. We buried him March 25th, 71. So it was, seemed like forever, it really did. I, w I was out of school the whole time. So, yeah. And then, you know, on, on, for me personally, it, it kind of really was twisted. I didn't, I didn't want his memory forgotten. And I always thought to myself, gosh, you know, I, I got to do something. But, I, you know, it didn't happen until years later, but it happened when it happened. And it was perfect timing because when I was raising the flag for Vietnam veterans, they didn't get their welcome home. But I made it something bigger than Tom. So I know he's a lot proud, more proud than uh, just doing something for him and Marshall. Two ships down at 
by the LZ. I've got three of the crew members off one of the ships. I think there are five people left in there while the ship was on fire. And they want the other ship brought them to the rear. Shot out of there with the transmission. Okay, who was it, you know? Had yeah, negative knowledge on that. I've got the crew. But all the disrespect and the spitting and all the things that went on, and baby killers, and these are young kids, 17, 18, 19 years old, going off to Southeast Asia. <laughs> Unbelievable, because their government asked them to or made them. So you, know, you can fast forward 40 some years, you got the Western Slope Vietnam War Memorial Park and uh, it's a great tribute. I think I miss him most right in February. I was 10 days from being 17 when he's killed. And uh, I was born on the 18th, he's killed on the 8th. And so, you know, I always, I think I reminisce about him a little bit more than I normally do. I feel him, you know, I feel him. It's like, uh, Sometimes I'll have a dream or two, you know, about us when we were kids. It's, you know, he's still young. I'm young. It's pretty cool. And I, I know his voice, and uh, he knows mine. And uh, I'm extremely proud of uh, Tom. And uh, he didn't even have to go. He didn't. Him and Marshall got in a car accident, and Tom ended up landing on his face on North Avenue. They had been drinking. Tom skidded across the road. His, his busted up his jaws and he got a, uh, they didn't know it, but he had a rebuilt tear duct in his eye. And being a pilot, they didn't know it. He didn't want them to know it. And uh, he went in anyway. That's what he wanted to do, he wanted to fly. He wanted to come home. I was gonna be his number one pilot. We were gonna start a business at Walker Field, use his GI Bill, and then we were gonna ski skiers, or fly skiers, to Aspen, Vail, wherever. Pretty innovative for an 18-year-old boy. That's when Jean-Claude Keeley won four gold medals in skiing. Huh? Pretty sharp, pretty sharp kid. Things turned, but uh, at the end of the day, Again, fast forward 50 years, a lot of these guys are getting their, getting their welcome home right here. Well, I'm not a big go to church. Pretty much I go to church right here. But you know, really this is my, this is my church right here. This is where I get my communion and everything. That, it's just more, more meaningful for me. This is a good month. You know, December, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, the thing is, died for your sins, and uh, the vets died for your freedom. <laughs> it's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. The American flag represents unity within a 50 states. And as much as our differences are, when we collectively come together, there's no stopping us. If it's humanitarian or if it's war, I mean, we, we have been blessed with uh, the gift of, of blood 
for over 200 years. Hopefully the next generation knows that if they want to continue to be free, they got to live responsibly and love thy neighbor. A real life, a real living, breathing human being that uh, was young. Some didn't want to go. Some did go. A lot of them that came back, Agent Orange, they're paying that price right now. Freedom, I appreciate it. That price of freedom needs to uh, be instilled in every red-blooded American that believes in this country. <laughs>